and you pronounced it perfectly, perfectly. It actually means Christmas tree in Japanese, apparently, my surname, but I am Italian, I promise. So thank you so much, Swami, for, I, can I speak? Can I call you Swami? No, Chancellor Swami. Uh, for your words, especially the word common good, which is really going to be the kind of cross-cutting theme today. Uh, James for the fantastic introduction, and Sheila for the incredible tender loving care. What's weird about traveling in this moment, as you just said, right, that we're all finally traveling again, is that people aren't really used to it, so you get extra care. <laughs> and I'm sure you would have given it anyway, but just getting picked up by Gregor at the train station. No one has ever picked me up at the train station, I think, for like 15 years. So, oh, what am I doing? Wrong? Sorry. Ooh, I, okay. um, I'm taller than all the boys, so I have to. Um, <laughs> anyway, so it's such a pleasure to be here. I actually got my PhD at the New School, the, the, the cousin, the sister, what is it, the, the, the brother, the, the real partner, I think, with UMass Amherst in terms of new economic thinking. And you might have heard of at least the the non-economists in the room, you might have heard of John Maynard Keynes. Um, he had this wonderful quote. He said, practitioners on the ground who think they're just kind of getting the job done are often slaves of, um, of, econ of, sorry, of defunct economic thinking. So slaves of the old way of thinking about the economy. So if we're interested in better practice and better policies, and I'm sure we all are because the world is not a perfect place by any means, uh, we need new economic thinking and we need to have a relationship between the two. And that's really what I'm going to be focusing a lot on today, that if we actually care about some of the biggest problems that we're facing around the globe, we need to ask ourselves why is it also that we've been so inertial that we're not acting with speed but also with that kind of care to the design of what actually needs to be done and why we have these very problematic assumptions uh, guiding policy and why having better policies also needs to be debunking constantly those assumptions, so that kind of feedback. And the lecture, I've called it directing economic growth because there's this kind of curious thing that we talk about directions in terms of really important words that are out there, including the sustainable development goals, these really ambitious 17 goals that we have since 2015 that the whole world decided on together. They've actually been signed up to by basically every country. We talk about things like green growth and the Green Deal. We talk about industrial strategy or anyone who's been to Brussels maybe not, in the last years, you'll know that the European Commission has for 10 years now been talking about directed growth in terms of smart, inclusive, sustainable growth. So there's this language about the direction. It's not growth for growth's sake. And yet on the ground, coming back to that point I just made in terms of the practice, we're not designing our tools or the relationships between all the different actors in the system in a directed way to actually fuel a very different type of growth which solves those problems that are underlying those ambitious words like sustainable development goals of which if you read what they are, zero hunger, zero poverty, clean oceans and so on, require a very particular direction to our investments and relationships. So I'm gonna be talking about what would it look like if we actually elevate that word directionality to actually designing our capitalist system and shaping it, as opposed to taking it as a given, to actually also have a conversation of what that direction should be, because these aren't directions that are kind of top down. Um, so we're also, of course, living through the moment that Swami just talked about, which is a, a tragic moment, one that we also found ourselves globally so, so badly prepared. If you just think back to that March 2020, when you know, COVID became a household word, we failed miserably globally to just even do the very basic, like giving so-called essential workers, who we called essential, but haven't been treating them as essential, personal protection equipment. Many of them died because they didn't have that personal protection equipment. We failed to deliver test and trace systems and often didn't even have the capacity on the ground to implement it. In the UK where I live, we actually managed to outsource test and trace to Deloitte, a consulting company, that the last time I checked, that wasn't exactly their expertise. In fact, they did a terrible job. We also, also continue to fail to deliver on the vaccine because you know, I'll be using the word mission in a minute, but the mission is not the vaccine. The mission, of course, is to vaccinate the entire 
world. When you have a global pandemic, you're only as safe as your neighbor is, as the next country is, as the world is. So we have today what Dr. Tedros, the head of the World Health Organization, calls vaccine apartheid, <laughs> where 80% of the vaccines are being hoarded by 10% of the countries. So we have failed miserably on that. We've also failed miserably on all sorts of social goals around COVID, like the digital divide, right? As we have had children and students globally uh, being locked down, uh, many continue to have their you know, human right to education, but most did not. The digital divide means that many were not able to continue learning at home due to the lack of digital technology, broadband, and so on. So really stark wake-up call. Uh, but we don't need that wake-up call if we're honest. We've now been talking about climate change forever. And as Greta Thornburg, when she was already 16, now she's 18, says, stop blah, blah, blahing. <laughs> when your house is on fire, what do you do? Do you sit there and debate? Should I stay? Should I go? You get out, and you get out fast. And you might have seen the IPCC report, the last one that came out just a couple weeks ago. It continues to tell us we have very, very few years left. It is very soon becoming irreversible, this problem of the climate emergency. And yet, if you look at the numbers, even during COVID-19 um, with the recovery funds, we continued actually to subsidize fossil fuel projects. And if you look at both at the US, also the European Union, we have over the last 10 years continued to subsidize fossil fuel industries, even though we continue to talk about issues like sustainability and so on, because it sounds really good. And what's striking is that we seem to just have gotten used to this pattern of going from crisis to crisis to crisis, right? The financial crisis, which in some ways we still feel the ramifications of, um, and, and we haven't solved it at all, by the way. So the ratio of private debt to disposable income, so private debt, not public debt, to disposable income in many countries like the UK is back at the record levels it was just before the financial crisis, and that's what caused the financial crisis. So we have hardly even really gone after the sources of that financial bubble. But of course, again, financial crises, climate crises, health crises, so on and so forth. And it's almost like we've just gotten super used to this reactive mode, just kind of patching up the system, right? So now we're already feeling that we can, you know, maybe some of us take our masks off and maybe, you know, it's, it's over, but we continue to be totally unprepared for the next pandemic. And um, you might have read some of the scientific uh, uh, journal articles about this. So as the permafrost melts due to climate change, many new viruses will appear. So you'd think that all these things would be alerting us to how to become proactive and not reactive, and also go to the source of the problem. Just like if a doctor is just you know, going after the sy symptoms of your illness, you will keep getting sick. So what I want to do just for maybe five minutes is depress you a bit more, and then I promise that the rest will be super positive and also very practical um, in terms of what I've been learning around the world and actually how to design policy in this more outcomes-oriented, proactive way to truly be about solving the biggest problems that we have and we will continue to have unless we actually go through that redesign, but also what that means for all the different actors in the system. It's not just about government, it's also about businesses and what it means to really put issues around corporate governance at the center of that as well. But first, as I just said, we need a bit of time to reflect, just like when, you know, if you've seen Ken Loach's films about um, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, the first thing to say is, I am Joe, I'm an alcoholic. Well, I think we have the same process to go through when we continue to cause an addiction, actually, in our economies to a very problematic form of growth. If we don't admit that dysfunctionality, then it's going to be really hard to come out of it. And so just, again, a bit briefly, because this would be a whole lecture in itself, um, uh, what, we've, what we've almost gotten used to in the financial sector, which is one of the you know, large sectors in the economy, is that it basically has been financing itself. So financing other parts of the broadly defined financial sector, finance, insurance, and real estate. The acronym there is FIRE. And this uh, uh, graph here from Andy Haldane um, at the Bank of England shows how in many countries the uh, the um, share of financial intermediation as a percentage of gross value added has been outpacing 
the rest of the economy, and not because it has then been used to actually fund things actually happening in the real economy, but very much in terms of what I just mentioned, actually that money going back into other parts of the financial sector, including just making it really easy for people to take out loans. Even again during COVID-19 in many countries to stimulate the economy, kind of making it easier for people to buy homes, well, that's a problem if your real wages haven't been increasing for the last 30 years. That partly increases, again, well, it's, it's, it's a key factor to increasing uh, private debt. So this kind of financialized form of finance, you know, after the financial crisis, lots of liquidity was created by the global financial system. Something like 80% of that went back to the financial sector. So unless it's actually accompanied by um, ambitious fiscal policy that's actually also in creating opportunities in the real economy, that mismatch between the idea that we just need more finance, more money, without actually focusing on what do we want from the real economy itself, so that new money creation actually lands on the structures that we need, including today stronger global health systems, then we are completely missing the trick. Um, second, Business is also financialized. It's not just finance not going into the real economy where businesses are. Businesses in the real economy themselves have become overly financialized. And some of your own researchers here at UMass Amherst, uh, Lenari Palladino, has been doing work on this as I have and many others like Bill Azonic, just actually trying to create indicators that actually help us better understand this dysfunction. And if you look at share buybacks, for example, which is a tool that would be okay if it's just you know, uh, moderate levels. Uh, the excessive use of share buybacks over the last uh, 50 years by companies that are really just focused on boosting their share prices by buying back their own shares, boosting share prices, stock options, surprise, surprise, executive pay, which many executives, as you know, get paid partly in stock options. This has been extraordinary, just the amount of kind of lack of reinvestment back into the real economy by businesses themselves. Uh, the latest figures actually I just looked at the other day calculate that about five trillion, that's 12 zeros, dollars have been used by the global, by the Fortune 500 companies just to buy back their own stock. So this lack of reinvestment into, again, uh, kind of production structures, you know, new machinery, human capital, training, you know, this is one of the key problems that we have today in terms of also technological change. What's interesting is that we blame the robots, right? It's like robots are taking our jobs, but actually mechanization since the times of the Industrial Revolution have in fact been labor displacing for 200 years. David Ricardo wrote about this back in 1821 in that first big economics textbook, uh, Principles of Political Economy, chapter 31 called On Machinery, looked at that date labor displacing effect of technology, as did Karl Marx, of course, he was one of the uh, first also who really tried to examine that issue around mechanization and what it would do to all sorts of things, including uh, rates of profit, which we won't go into. Um, so what's interesting is that today we say robots are taking our jobs, when actually what happened since the time of Ricardo is that Yes, technology was labor displacing, but as long as the profits being generated were reinvested back into the economy, then actually new sectors, new jobs, new skills were needed. So that kind of creative destruction also on the employment side. So it's really a, a huge corporate governance issue and, and we're blaming these poor robots. Um, but you see these patterns also if you look at the investment ratio, this is what this uh, graph is about here, um, the investment share of global GDP. Um, using different metrics, you can find it uh, falling, and of course this kind of extraction of value that James talked about, I wrote a whole book about it called The Value of Everything, is, is one of the leading uh, sources of modern forms of inequality today. Um, and, you know, much more attention on the governance of companies, why? Because the market is not business. We, we sometimes get lazy with our words, right? Like, you might hear people saying the state and the market. No, the market is an outcome of how we organize our economy, how we govern public institutions, how we govern private institutions, how we govern their interrelationship, 
There's also civil society institutions, including trade unions. So seeing the market as an outcome of governance decisions within different types of organizations, but also how they interrelate one to another is incredibly important. And that's why I think that some of the calls also to action by some large companies, including BlackRock, this is Larry Fink here, who every year writes a letter to his shareholders and says, we, you know, we're, we've lost our way. We can't just be about maximizing shares. We need to maximize stakeholder value. So give back to communities and, and workers and talking about purpose. It's a weak concept unless it goes to the center of the system. How do we actually put stakeholder value and a different way to think about value at the center of how business relates to government, relates to finance? How, you know, what would a purposeful <laughs> capitalist system look like? What would stakeholder value look like in terms of how we actually produce, how we innovate, how we collaborate? So I'll come back to that. But this call to stakeholder value in some ways is like the, the kind of fluffy uh, discussion point in reflection of some of those patterns I just uh, talked to you about that are really about extraction. And the fact that companies at least are reflecting about it, I think, is an opportunity that I'll come back to at the end. What would it look like to walk the talk of stakeholder value? For example, how we actually produce vaccines, how we collaborate between public and private, how we put conditionalities at the centers of those collaborations. Uh, third, this is still the bit where I'm depressing you. Um, I promise it's almost over, the depressing bit. They've given me a huge amount of time to talk to you, so let me depress you a bit more, is how we govern the public sector. Um, so again, there's nothing inevitable in how we govern business. There's nothing inevitable in how we've actually chosen to govern our public institutions. So I don't like the word the state. The state is actually you know, made up of lots of different types of uh, public actors. And my book, uh, The Entrepreneurial State, I talked about that decentralized network of different types of public actors, but just in terms of the misgovernance, I think that the problem is not only that kind of super ideological kind of Reaganite, Thatcherite view of, oh, the state's just the problem. To be honest, when there's adults in the room, you don't really hear that. When there's adults in the room, what you do hear is another form of problematic way of talking about the role of the public sector, which is at best fixing market failures. So I think this is a big problem because if we are interested in um, you know, tackling the sustainable development goals, if we are interested in getting prepared uh, for the next pandemic, if we are interested in tackling in a proactive, not a reactive uh, way, global warming, it's going to be very hard to do that just by tinkering on the edges, putting you know, bandages here and there. And the idea of market failure fixing is not a bad one. I don't think we should throw the baby out with the bath water. Um, but you know, the fact that we even talk about public goods, which sound good, one of the two words is good, as um, areas we need to invest in because of positive externalities that need fixing, means that the public good has been framed as a correction. It's not even an objective. It's not a proactive objective of what we're trying to do. For that, I think it's more useful to think about things like the common good, which you know, I'm, I'm not religious, but the Pope, who's a pretty radical guy, that's why he got his cook to come with him from Argentina because I think he thought he was going to get poisoned. But if you listen to the Pope's speeches, he's quite revolutionary actually in how he talks about the common good, the preferential option for the poor. How he talks about it is very much an objective of how we need to think about what society can strive for and work together to achieve really important goals around inequality, health, climate, and so on. And yet, we even have gotten used to framing really important tools, say like carbon taxes, uh, which are just one of the many things that need to happen if we are interested in uh, you know, tackling global warming, as correcting for the opposite of positive externalities, negative externalities. So carbon taxes would correct for that problem by actually forcing companies to um, uh, embed that cost in their uh, thinking, so to pollute less, but again, are we actually gonna be able to just patch up the system in order to fight global warming? Carbon taxes are important, but they're being framed as a correction to what otherwise would be a perfectly well-functioning market. So markets work well, sometimes they have problems, so introduce a mechanism to do that. Even funding of basic R&D, I was talking before about positive externalities, we all know we need innovation, but again, it's correcting for a problem. 
funding small medium enterprises, correcting for information asymmetries, the need, the need for counter-cyclical government, correcting for coordination failures. So again, it's not that we have, uh, that we don't have these market failures, but the fact that we actually think we can steer a system by correcting and patching things up with different types of bandages is a huge problem. And that view of government, I'm still on this kind of third big dysfunctionality, then has unfortunately been also used to train civil servants who, you know, this idea of market failure theory then found its way into, you know, masters in public administration uh, courses around the world in terms of actually convincing uh, civil servants that, again, at best they can fix a market failure, then get out of the way, but also to introduce through new public management um, ideas of efficiency, net present value, cost-benefit analysis that are coming from the private sector into the public sector, also because one of the underlying theorems there is that government failure is even worse than market failure. So this kind of idea that you need to constantly be in the watch of corruption, of nepotism, which are a problem, I'm sure we'll get to that in, in the Q&A, but the fact that we actually have designed the system almost based on fear of corruption, fear of nepotism, fear of government failure, fear of market failure doesn't really help us actually get the kind of training that we need for a really ambitious, creative civil service. And what's interesting is I'm very interested in curriculums in the institute I've set up. We've just tried to kind of rewrite the curriculum for global civil servants. Um, is that if you think of the classes that managers take at the top business schools, right, and MBAs, not MPAs, they're really exciting. I mean, even just the names of these courses, like strategic management, decision sciences, organizational behavior, or textbooks that say, um, you know, rejuvenating the mature corporation. Why do you need to rejuvenate the mature corporation? Because a mature company, just like any mature organization might get sluggish, inertial, slow. But we know that corporations create value, right? So we need to rejuvenate them. We need to think out of the box, maybe do a multi-divisional company like GM did back then in order to resist that inertia. Whereas when government bureaucracies get in the way or are inertial, we just almost think it's in the DNA of government itself. And I deeply think that this is very much because we haven't thought about public institutions as co-creating and co-shaping the economy alongside um, private institutions. At best, they're there to fix markets, to enable, to de-risk the risk takers, to level the playing field so someone cool can go play the game. And so all the words we've used that actually very much come from that siloed way to think about government as at best fixing markets, of course then, in a self-fulfilling prophecy kind of way, create these problematic uh, 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 public institutions, which are then often too vertical, too inertial, not agile, um, uh, not flexible, and so on. Um, and so what really struck me when I started writing um, well, actually it struck me a long time ago, but still what constantly strikes me is that we've just gotten so stuck in not questioning these governance structures. We've gotten stuck in complaining about finance. We've gotten stuck in you know, listening to proclamations that shareholder value doesn't work, and so maybe we need something like stakeholder value, but not seeing hardly any change. In fact, it's actually getting worse by all the metrics, like the ones I mentioned before. But especially getting stuck in having types of policies that are, again, at best, fixing different types of problems, being framed in that way, and the language itself through which we talk about it just being you know, incredibly boring. Again, facilitating. Facilitating who? Making it easier for someone else to do something. Um, and what's striking, though, is that when we've actually managed as humanity to do pretty hard things, like going to the moon 51 years ago, where the objective was not just to get to the moon and hang out there and die, but to get there and come back in a short amount of time, the way that public and private work together, the way that government actually led but didn't micromanage, the language that was used, the design of the collaborations, the design of the contracts, the need to reorganize the, 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 the public and the private organizations in question was incredibly ambitious. <laughs> and we would have never gotten to the moon uh, had it just been about fixing markets or one side facilitating or de-risking the other. And so the real kind of, I think, call to action here is that, well, guess what? <laughs> if that required 
you know, a, an ambition, a creativity, an entrepreneurialism amongst all the different actors, and an attention to the design about actually building what I call symbiotic and not parasitic public-private partnerships, then surely we should be learning from this instead of just constantly, again, getting stuck in that old language. And if market failure fixing didn't help us get to the moon and back, it surely is not gonna help us solve what's even harder, which is all these wicked problems. They're wicked, the sustainable development goals, because they require not just technological change, they require uh, behavioral change, regulatory change, um, social change, and so on. And so what I've been trying to do in my work um, through, through different books, but also through this institute that I've set up, is to ask what would it look like to have a, a framing that is kind of as rigorous as market failure fixing, that we have a whole body of academic work around, if we actually were talking about co-shaping and co-creating an economy. What does it look like for the theory of value? What does it look like for the underlying organizational competence? What does it look like for the metrics, even ex post, that we need to evaluate uh, whether we're achieving a particular type of co-creation and co-shaping? And so I'll be focusing more on this kind of third book, which for me is like a recipe book on how to actually do this stuff in a practical way. But the previous two books I wrote, they're kind of a trilogy in terms of the story I tell. The first one, The Entrepreneurial State, was very much about that needed change of language, especially looking at the history, right? Like the history of the whole, you know, the internet, but literally everything that makes your smart product smart and not stupid actually came out of government investment. You know, internet, GPS, touchscreen, Siri. And not only was it government investment, but it was government investment through purpose-oriented organizations. The internet did not come about because someone said, oh, we need the internet. Like everyone today obsessing about AI and driverless cars and so on. The internet was a solution to a problem. They needed the satellites to communicate. The internet was the answer. GPS, no one said, we need GPS, funky technology. It was a solution to a problem that the Navy had of knowing where all the you know, ships were exactly um, around the world and our oceans. So, it's true of many of these publicly funded organizations that actually they were required, um, they not only required that early stage, high risk, high capital intensive funding that governments are better able to provide due to a lot of risk aversity in the private sector, but there was a particular organizational setup that led to it, which we just completely ignore in economics. We don't have dummy variables in our regression saying whether it's a kind of you know, purpose oriented public investment or not. And by the way, I think Keynesian economics has been part of the problem because Keynes himself was very ambitious when you read what he wrote. He had this whole thing that government should not just be tinkering on the edges but really do what's not being done. But how it's often been interpreted is at best counter-cyclical investment versus also the organizational structure, the organizational form that's required in that investment. So public banks, innovation agencies, and that collaboration between public and private. So the entrepreneurial state for me was about debunking the word entrepreneurship. It's not about a particular private sector culture. It's about a system. How do you really nurture an entrepreneurial system which also requires that thinking out of the box and purpose-oriented culture inside the public sector, but also how do you design the system to make sure that the rewards from this huge amounts of public investment, like the 40 billion that the National Institutes of Health put into the system every year for drug innovation, how do we make sure we also govern that entrepreneurial innovation system so it also produces, you know, <laughs> good for people and not just profits, and I think we failed miserably to do that. And the value of everything, I unpicked what that actually meant also for our understanding of value as collectively created. So it's not just value being created through uh, you know, production function analysis and then government coming in to, again, either facilitate or redistribute that value through taxation, but that idea of collective intelligence, what is the theory of value that's required underlying that, but also what does it mean for value within um, you know, moving beyond, again, shareholder value in companies, collective value creation between actors, but also how to redistribute, again, that value in such a way that we're not just socializing risks, but also rewards. What is the theory of value uh, behind that? How do we make, how can we have a pre-distributive understanding of inequality so we don't continue to create value in a problematic way? 
pick up the pieces in order to battle inequality. So it's a theory of value that we need also for pre-distribution. Um, and coming to this uh, latest book, what interested me so much was that, again, the moon landing 51 years ago, which we all kind of you know, know something about from books and movies and, and, and so on, was also like a political economy project. It was not just aerospace. It required a particular type of leadership within government that I think we lack often. And don't think of this as a normative point. You, know, you can also have leadership in, in wars, <laughs> we know that. But that kind of idea of a vision, a targeted vision, a direction of travel, literally going to the moon and back in a short amount of time, that, that level of leadership and vision that was very explicit, that then fostered a lot of that bottom-up experimentation, was very, very interesting to me. And the idea of experimentation, the welcoming of uncertainty, as opposed to fearing it, and there's also a difference between risk and uncertainty, um, we are not used to that. We are used to talking about, um, you know, again, as I mentioned before, one actor facilitating the other. I'll, I'll come back to these points in a minute. I just want to put them all up here. Uh, a lot of attention to organizational design, so issues around capabilities. A lot of attention to building tools that were outcomes focused, as opposed to thinking you could just put a lot of money in the system, stir the soup, and hope for the best. And a lot of attention on partnership. So when NASA worked with the business sector, they didn't just say, oh, come in, let's you know, work together. A lot of attention to actually how to build that partnership in such a way that would really foster as much innovation as possible, but also more equitable outcomes. Uh, they didn't talk about participation, but I'm going to get to that towards the end, so I've just put it up there to, to put it up as, a, as sort of a bookmark of something I'll be talking about. So in Kennedy's famous speeches in the early days, you know, and, and I'm sure most people remember this or have heard about it, but it, it, it is very important from the policy perspective, the idea that we're doing it, we're going to the moon because it's hard, not because it's easy. So the reason I don't like the concept of government facilitating business is the word facilitating comes from the Latin facile, or Italian, um, Italian after Latin, uh, which means easy, right? So he did not say, we're going to the moon and it's going to be hard and government is going to facilitate and make things easier for business to do it. This idea that it was going to be incredibly hard and both public and private would have to embrace that difficulty together. This is actually a deeply important point in terms of reframing the kind of bogus, siloed, inertial, boring way that we talk about policy. And just look at any white paper, I encourage you, look at any policy wonk white paper. It's, it's filled with this idea of facilitating, of enabling, of de-risking, right? So he talked about the need for experimentation. He also said it was going to cost a lot of money, less than we spend on cigars and cigarettes every year, he said, but it would cost a lot of money. Uh, it was worth it. Uh, so, you know, bear with us. We're going to have to also make a lot of mistakes along the way. He talked about the difficulty in the sense that there will be mistakes made along the way. So the admission that experimentation, trial and error, learning by doing is required for, you know, a very difficult task. It's actually a deep point, right? So do we allow our civil servants to make mistakes without being on the front page of the Daily Mail? Do, you don't have the Daily Mail. What do you have here? That's like, what are the terrible papers? The Sun? Sorry? The Post. Got it. Okay. I haven't lived here for a while. Um, okay. This, okay. <laughs> Everyone's got their favorite terrible paper to rag on. Um, and so, and what was striking is they, they were kind of bluffing in the beginning. They had no idea how to get to the moon. I mean, if you, I really encourage you to listen to this great podcast that the BBC put out on the last, um, uh, I think like 30 hours, um, and it's, it's just really just a great podcast. But also through that, they also talk about you know the the early days, and literally they didn't know, and so they finally ended up with this lunar orbit rendezvous. But the level of experimentation and willingness to pursue very different types of uh, trajectories was again interesting because it's not what we do today. <laughs> um, we continue to try to find the easiest route and to worry about the failures, to worry about the, the high risks and any sort of cost benefit analysis would have killed any you know, ambition to go to the moon in the first place. And one of the things they realized, again, you know, really early on, was that the mistakes could also be fatal, could be you know, terrible like the Apollo 1 fire. But what was interesting with the Apollo 1 fire was that the result of that was a massive organizational change inside NASA. 
So one of the astronauts who died, there was three of them, Gus Grissom, before dying on that same day said, how are we gonna get to the moon if we can't even talk between two or three buildings? Because they couldn't hear literally what was being said to them in mission control room. So we've all gotten used to this as like a normal thing, right? All the governments working within their own little department, no proper communication, departmental silos is a word that people often talk about. Whereas what they did was they realized if we are purpose oriented, if we have this really difficult ambition, getting to the moon and back in a short amount of time, not only do we need to you know, perhaps fail along the way, but we better restructure our organization as we learn how to do this. So what they did was they brought in George Mueller from Bell Labs. Remind me to tell you something very interesting about Bell Labs later. I'm terrible because I speak in parentheses. So I'm not gonna do that, I'm gonna keep focused. Um, Anyway, George Mueller came from Bell Labs on the back of that fire to help the organization become more flexible, more agile, less departmentally siloed, so that you know, famous new NASA structure, which also DARPA ended up having, DARPA, which funded the internet, kind of project managers each with their delegated teams, you know, bringing in the top people to actually run these projects, but the main thing of constant communication between them. So kind of vertical teams that were in constant communication, so horizontal flow of information to have that kind of all of, today we'd say all of government approach, all of departmental approach within NASA, that was needed, not because they talked about purpose as a thing in itself, but because they needed that organizational, organizational structure, more flexible, more agile, more horizontal, in order to actually achieve what they needed. The other thing is that I don't think people um, realize as much as one should, is that this was a massive collective effort. There was about 400,000 people total involved in the entire Apollo program. If you look at all also the different businesses and literally every single person that had something to do with the program, but lots of different sectors. It wasn't just aerospace in the same way that climate change today is not just renewable energy. So there was innovations in nutrition and materials and electronics. Uh, the whole software industry in some ways was a, was a spillover of it, but a lot of, um, you know, earthly goods that ended up being very useful, like camera phones, athletic shoes, home insulation, foil blankets, water pur purification systems, were solved along the way. So yes, there was a mission, a big targeted one, but a lot of homework problems had to be solved along the way in this purpose-oriented way, as I said before, where the technology is a solution to a problem. And it was, again, intersectoral we would call it dynamic spillovers across many different sectors. Um, and it didn't just happen because they said, oh, we need a lot of dynamic spillovers. NASA itself, one of the first things the head of procurement, this guy called Ernest Brackett did, um, to try to really help foster that bottom-up experimentation across many different sectors was to redesign procurement away from being cost plus, um, which he just felt was you know, causing a lot of, you know, payouts from NASA to the private sector without stimulating the innovation that was needed, more towards a fixed price scheme, like a challenge almost, like there was a prize you'd get, a fixed price with it, and then you'd get extra if you achieved you know, all sorts of different uh, targets around quality and innovation uh, improvement. So a target, target amount of money with incentives for innovation and quality improvement, and also they had a clause in the contracts of no excess profits. Really interesting, right? Because you, you know, this, is, this is about making profits. You don't get to the moon through charity, through philanthropy. We're not gonna solve the vaccine problem either <laughs> through charity or philanthropy, but doing business in a way with both public and private and not turning it into a gambling casino was on their mind. I mean, I just found that incredible. What is excess? In excess of what? In excess of what you're actually doing, <laughs> right? So given that this is a massive collective effort, public and private, what is the right way, not necessarily to share the profits, we can get to that later when we look at different ways that we can do profit sharing. NASA couldn't make a profit, but they could hold down the costs, you know, and, 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 and share in the way that actually it was governed. Something really, really important today, I think, for the pharmaceutical industry. So lots of different companies, but how they work together was governed in a particular way. It wasn't just like, oh, let's commercialize uh, you know, space, what's happening today. The same guy, Ernest Brackett, he really was a hero, an unknown hero, um, said, oh, and we won't even know who to work with in the private sector, or how to write the terms of reference if we become stupid. <laughs> because he was seeing what was already happening back then was this massive amount of outsourcing 
already, by the way, to companies like McKinsey, but we won't go into that. Um, I'm writing a whole book on the McKinseyfication. You can replace the I with the U if you'd like, of our economies. Um, I'm, I'm gonna try to be polite, I promise. I always forget that American audiences or, or speakers are more controlled than Italian ones. So, but, <laughs> um, but he, it, it was very interesting because he didn't say, um, don't outsource to the private sector. Of course they needed to work with the private sector. I just talked about huge amounts of public-private cooperation. But he knew that the government, or NASA, wouldn't be able to know who to work with or how to work with them, literally at the contract level, if they stopped investing in their own brain, that kind of insourcing of creativity that I was talking about before what I call the dynamic capabilities of the public sector itself, he was starting to see them being withered away through this excessive use of outsourcing. And he had this wonderful quote of, if we continue to do this, we will get captured by brochuremanship. Because at the time, they didn't have PowerPoints. They just had nice, shiny brochures. Um, and you know, as Kennedy already foresaw in the beginning, it was going to cost a lot of money, not as much as cigarettes and uh, cigars, he said, but it was a lot of money. It was $30 billion at the time. In today's dollars, it'd be $300 billion, much less than you know, we've spent on wars and so on. But the point is, the value that was actually created in the economy, think of it as like a Keynesian multiplier for every pound, dollar, euro of public money, how much you know, uh, extra kind of GDP does it produce due to um, the kind of crowding in and additionality, that kind of catalytic effect that public money can have. It was very much about that. Uh, those huge dynamic spillovers that happened along the way that I talked about in that cross-sectoral way created an immense amount of value, not just in terms of products and services, but also in terms of a, a growth. And so what I do in the book, and I've got um, kind of another 15 or so minutes left to do the positive part of the story in terms of the recommendations, because I mentioned the book is sort of like a recipe book, is to say, that's pretty interesting. You know, they, they, they designed a system to truly be collaborative, to foster collective intelligence, to not turn the system into a gambling casino, as we have today, I think, in the healthcare sector, where, again, we have $40 billion a year of NIH money going into drug innovation in the US, and we manage to just not even think about things like, let's make sure the prices of the drugs <laughs> reflect that public contribution. Let's make sure the intellectual property rights are not gamed and simply used for rent extraction. So that level of ambition in terms of the goal required them to then design their organization in that you know, funky way that they did with the project managers, the horizontal flow of information, procurement as challenge-oriented with incentives for innovation, cross-sectoral, but you know, done in such a way that was, was, was very uh, knowledgeable of that cross-sectoral collaboration they would require, but didn't just pretend that you could just say, come on, you know, many sectors come and play with us. They designed that collaboration in a very intentional, proactive, not reactive way, and no one ever talked about fixing market failures. This is very much about shaping and co-creating this, um, this landscape. And so what I did, so this is now going to get a bit practical, <laughs> uh, just giving you a sense of how some of these ideas can be put into practice. Um, of course, it's much more complicated than any one of the specific things I'm going to talk about, but I think they are important in terms of just getting us to think differently and especially ask questions like what would it look like if we actually scaled up some of these examples that I'm talking about in terms of how the system itself works instead of using them as exceptions. So one of the things I did was to ask with the European um, Commission, so I'm Italian, but I speak with an American accent because we moved to New Jersey when I was five, but I've been living in Europe now for the last, uh, God, 20 years? No. I don't remember. I moved there in 20, in 1999. How many years is that? That's not 20 years. How many years is that? Uh, 22 years. That's a long time. And I managed to have four kids in, in five years, the first years I was there. That's why it's all a complete fuzz. <laughs> um, anyway, so I, I, I'm, I'm Italian, but um, again, lived in Europe, have been living in Europe for a long time, and what's interesting is Europe as a region has, in theory, this kind of innovation policy. So currently it's called the Horizon Program. Uh, before it was called the Seventh Framework Program, and so on. And what struck me was, coming back to my first slide, it was very ambitious about like the goals, right? Smart growth, inclusive growth, sustainable growth. But then you looked at all the metrics of what was being achieved, none of that was actually happening, at least not, not through the innovation policy. So I said, what would it look like 
if instead of just blabbing on about, you know, Greta's point, blah, 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 instead of just blabbing on about inclusive, sustainable growth, we actually brought some of these lessons to how we design an innovation policy. So starting with the challenges, you know, inclusive, sustainable uh, growth, or the SDGs, which in Europe, by the way, are talked about a lot more than the United States. My kids who go to primary school, state education, um, sorry, when they went to primary school in London, they sung the SDGs. The SDGs are actually taught in school. I don't know if, if, if it happens here in Amherst, maybe it does. No, not even Amherst, not even Berkeley, no. So it's really bad. Um, anyway, so you start with the goals that we've decided on, but then turning them into these kind of concrete moonshots because the, the government didn't just say, beat the Russians, space race, Sputnik. They turned it into a very clear goal, to the moon and back in one generation. Why is that important? Because you can answer, did you do it? So forget the conspiracy theories that say that it never happened. But you know, getting to the moon and back in a short amount of time, you can say yes or no. Talking just about climate change as a, as a big challenge, all right, and? So how do you turn that challenge uh, into a very concrete target that you can actually say yes or no. Second point, how do you do it in a way that's cross-sectoral so you don't get into this kind of picking winners problem where a lot of money is just given to one sector because it's lobbied its way up or two sectors or three sectors into the system. So truly get missions which are, again, targeted ways to think about our challenges but that foster that immense intersectoral collaboration. And third, what does it mean for designing every tool we have from grants, loans, uh, procurement policy, which I talked about before, uh, bailouts, recovery programs during a COVID-19 recovery period to foster that bottom-up experimentation to reach that goal. So in this report that I wrote for them, I gave kind of these two examples, one around climate, one around um, clean oceans, so SDG 13 and 14. For the oceans one, you know, which is SDG 14, getting 90% of the plastic out over the next five years, what would that mean for all the different sectors that would be part of that, both in terms of how to get the stuff out, but especially the new materials going in, uh, but also all sorts of different services and, and marine and, and ports and so on. So, and then that design issue about how to actually use all the different levers to foster projects, whether it's reusable and biodegradable plastic substitutes, substitutes, plastic and microplastic digestion mechanisms, autonomous ocean stations to remove plastic pollution, but also in terms of climate change, the, the, the mission was 100 carbon neutral cities uh, around Europe and you know, lots of different sectors, not just renewable energy, but also you know, many different types of projects, including all sorts of you know, uh, projects we need to actually make our mobility systems clean, so clean urban electric mobility and so on. So instead of focusing on the projects as a thing in and of itself, right, electric vehicles, that's a project. What's the actual goal? How can we really have that kind of all of government approach, but public-private partnership, intersectoral collaboration um, in order to get there? And a second report I wrote called Governing Missions, it was more about like the how, like what does this then mean about the design of again these instruments including public banks, development finance institutions, which often are themselves part of the problem. They're just giving out money to whichever sector might ask for, for help. What does it mean to introduce conditionalities within, for example, public banks that then would give out loans conditional on private companies that receive those loans to actually be part of a you know, sustainable growth path? What does it mean for that issue around adaptability and flexibility of the organizations, impact-driven uh, budgeting sorry, outcomes-oriented budgeting processes. Uh, accountability, also in terms of how we actually value um, or evaluate the uh, projects themselves. So as I mentioned before, we have a lot of uh, static, not dynamic, uh, um, uh, evaluation mechanisms around net present value cost-benefit analysis. What would be the evaluation criteria that you would use to also measure those dynamic spillovers across all those different sectors. That requires a different type of metric to evaluate what you achieved. Because you could almost put it the other way, even if they hadn't gotten to the moon, by designing it in the way that I talked about, would have still created a lot of that value in terms of dynamic spillovers. How would you actually capture that in a, you know, in a finance ministry, given that that's where also a lot of the uh, purse strings often lie? 
Um, and so that really does require that attention to the financing, to the capabilities within our government institutions require really unlearning a lot of the assumptions and the, the ideology in the end that's come from public choice theory, new public management. A report I helped uh, co-write with UNDP actually looked around the world and looked at you know, which countries actually did better during COVID-19 and found it was actually the ones who had invested very much in these types of capabilities that I'm talking about. Um, so Vietnam and Kerala, uh, on the back also of previous crises like the Nipah virus, had actually invested also in really important issues, uh, sorry, areas like building trusted relationships between academia, civil society, business and government, but also, you know, governing our digital platforms when we have an infodemic <laughs> matters. Um, so none of these just come out of thin air, it's actually results of an investment within uh, that kind of public administration side. Um, recently, I've been doing work with the BBC, which I think is a really ambitious public organization because it never talks about fixing markets. So PBS here, Public Broadcasting Service, you know, it's good, I'm sure we all watch it, and so on, but it's kind of stuck to this idea that it's there to do what the private sector is not doing, you know, what Fox News is not doing. So high quality news, documentaries, you know, really high level talk shows. The BBC has always thought of itself as a shaper, a co-creator, and, and, and has done it across any kind of format, soap operas, talk shows, high quality news, documentaries, but with a metric of public value inside to hold itself also accountable. So when it's making a soap opera about the working class, East Enders, and not just Dallas and Dynasty, what are those kinds of metrics that you require to also hold yourself accountable that you're really doing what's not being done, but in an ambitious way, not just filling the gap of something the private sector is not doing. So, Building these capabilities requires also putting time into asking things, well, what is public value? So this exercise we did with the BBC looked at it as a summation of kind of individual value, how much do people actually like the shows, are they good, but also social value, fighting against fake news or bringing diversity to the screen, participation um, uh, in, in different ways, but also industry value. So by being ambitious, through, for example, investing in the iPlayer, a new, um, well, a technology uh, a, a, um, where they put all the um, radio and television on an internet platform in a very innovative way that ended up actually crowding in all sorts of other uh, businesses around that platform. But also back in the 1980s, the BBC had a ambition, a mission to get everyone to code. And to do that, they uh, invested in the BBC a uh, microcomputer, which then actually had to be procured all the different parts, and that itself, in order to get a computer in the classroom all across uh, the UK, ended up requiring, again, a specific type of procurement method, which again, crowded in a lot of industry, but also, if you just look at their programming, including the R&D that they've done around uh, Blue Planet, which is David Attenborough's recent, uh, one of his recent documentaries, they've always invested also in the knowledge creation, the R&D, the kind of new thinking that's required for cutting edge uh, documentaries, talk shows, high quality news, and so on. But what does that then mean on how we actually evaluate the performance of such a public organization beyond asking the, the old questions of which market has to be fixed? Industrial strategy, I had it up as one of my first slides. You know, that's about directed um, economic growth. However, in the old, style of industrial strategy, which often doesn't work, it's when it ends up just being a list of sectors that a government might prioritize. In the UK, up until recently, they were prioritizing aerospace, automotive, financial services, life sciences, and the creative industries. So well, that sounds good, five sectors. To do what? <laughs> Lots of sectors aren't there. Um, so reversing the idea of industrial strategy as a list of sectors to prioritize, instead choosing challenges and missions, which then a lot of sectors, not just the ones that have lobbied their way up to being considered the top sectors, that's something that I think is very interesting in terms of a mission-oriented redesign of industrial strategy. So this work I did with the UK government, I forgot to say, by the way, that the European work I did ended up getting put into kind of law, so now they have these five mission areas that they've chosen and a part of the 100 billion horizon um, scheme in Europe is now dedicated towards these kind of different missions which then land at the member state level where then they you know, decide exactly what the missions are, but the mission areas um, have been decided uh, by the commission um, and, and their clean growth, uh, 
uh, soil and water uh, conservation, healthy cities, um, cancer, there's another one. Um, but, but the main thing is that those, those are the mission areas which then help design the innovation program where then the actual missions within those mission areas is left also to much more um, kind of local coordination. Uh, but it just means that instead of just talking about these challenges, uh, it's, it's now a tool for the innovation policy itself. And that was the idea here with the industrial policy, which is to start with the challenges and then backtrack on what the missions might be and you know, to actually foster that intersectoral dynamism. So in the UK, one of the uh, challenges was future of mobility and the mission they decided on through a work we did through this commission I ran was by 2040 to put the UK at the forefront of safe, sustainable, and universally accessible travel, creating congestion and admission-free zero accident systems. It's a mouthful, but just the fact that it actually had words like accessible, 100% accessible travel, meant that you know, some of these bubbles on the bottom were things like 100% accessible public transport with equal access across all models. So you just kind of get the picture that to fuel growth that's directed, it's not about kind of throwing a lot of money at a particular sector, but being very ambitious on the challenges and then using the levers like industrial strategy, innovation policy, or procurement to actually foster that intersectoral inter-actor uh, work. Also helped to design a mission-oriented public bank. As I mentioned, you know, sometimes public banks are part of the problem, just giving out money, subsidies, loans, and so on to problematic sectors that beg for help. Think of the steel sector, which is begging for help everywhere. A mission-oriented public bank helped design this in Scotland, where the point is to provide that kind of patient, long-term, committed, strategic finance to those organizations that are willing to work with you know, uh, the government around really important goals, and they're not told what to do. That's kept very open, otherwise you stifle innovation. But the fact that there's kind of conditionality linked to the loans moving in a particular system, sorry, particular trajectory, as opposed to just you know, by random categories like SME financing. If you are a small company, you might need extra help, but you don't get money because you're small, but because you're seen as being you know, willing to engage with some of these government missions. In, in Germany recently, because they have the Energiewende uh, Green Challenge, kind of directing a lot of their economic uh, policy, of course, this is now huge with the, the crisis of, of gas, um, they started to change the loans that were provided from the KFW, their public bank, to the steel sector, so the condition was that steel had to lower its material content, which it did. They now have one of the greenest steel production systems in the world because they used repurpose, reuse, recycle technology through the whole value chain, not because they went to uh, Davos, but because they had to. Let me just skip ahead. In Sweden, an interesting thing is these, this idea of mission orientation, I've worked quite a bit with Vinova, the Swedish innovation agency, has landed on the very particular, the very local. So they have this very high level challenge of a fossil free welfare state. Um, and it lands on the particular public transport, public education, public health. So in public education, school meals in Sweden have to be healthy, tasty, not just IKEA meatballs, and sustainable. And that then very specific kind of directed you know, outcome that they want is used to write contracts that are very specific and targeted for how, again, the private sector might procure in um, you know, innovative solutions around meals, but it's not just, oh, we need private sector you know, innovation to do school meals. It's, it's, it's very targeted. And second, they've gotten kids involved in it. So sustainable school meals become something they can learn about through the curriculum, and they also get kids to kind of help co-design some of these meals, so that issue of participation is very important, which is something I've also learned a lot about in my own local part of London. I live in Camden, North London, and I co-chair a Camden Renewal Commission where the idea of missions also falls in a very specific place like our housing estate, social housing, affordable housing. Camden has chosen its housing estates as the place where to really focus the clean growth mission. And instead of just talking about retrofitting buildings, it's very much also about participation, bringing communities, resident associations to the table from the beginning not just being lectured at, to actually debate what does it mean to live together in a more sustainable way. And part of that has also been to change some of the programs like food banks to food cooperatives. And as you know, food banks have popped all over the place 
due to hunger and poverty, which has been aggravated during COVID. So really bringing also that agency of citizens through a cooperative uh, form within some of these organizations that become central to mission orientation uh, is, is very important. Lastly, key point here is what it means for this issue of kind of sharing in the rewards instead of just the gambling casino that I mentioned before. This issue of conditionalities that I already mentioned with the public bank, I think it's quite interesting how differently countries have reacted in this kind of creation of money <laughs> that we've seen during the COVID-19 recovery programs, not all over the world, but think of the US big infrastructure funding, the Build Back Better, uh, discussion in Europe, the next gen EU uh, one trillion recovery fund, is that in some countries they've actually nested within that this idea of conditionality so the money is not just free giveaway to help businesses that are having a hard time, but that it's conditional on businesses actually changing how they're working. So in France, this is the picture of the French finance minister, both Renault and Air France received the loans in COVID-19 on condition that they were you know, willing to reduce their carbon emissions in the, in the next five years. And Denmark and Austria, the condition was to stop using tax havens. It's like, uh-huh, like why do we have to wait for you know, people to think that up? It's just so obvious. And yet, you know, building this kind of conditionality into these new uh, public schemes and creation of money. Um, but also, if you think of the huge issues right now, I talked about vaccine apartheid, how do we actually govern innovation processes, govern production, govern collaborations, govern collective intelligence in a mission-oriented way? So starting with what the goal is, backtrack in what it actually means for how you govern the innovation system. This is very much what uh, Jayati and I are trying to do in our council on the economics of health for all, for the WHO, World Health Organization. We say, focus on the goal, health for all, backtrack on what it actually means for procurement, outcomes-oriented budgeting, uh, public-private partnerships, intellectual property rights, conditionality of the functional, not dysfunctional type. And I really do believe, genuinely, that if we sort through some of these details that I'm talking about and put this issue of stakeholder value, you know, not just the academic literature about it, we know that's you know, an old thing, varieties of capitalism, but how it's being talked about by large companies, <laughs> if we put it at the center of a system of how actually to produce, to collaborate in the ways that I've been talking about, it's gonna be very disruptive. It's gonna mean doing the vaccines and how we've made them currently completely differently. It's gonna mean running our digital platforms differently. So instead of just money going in around digital and having to pick up the mess later around privacy taxation, doing it ex ante in a way that really fosters in the pre-distributive way the right kind of symbiotic public-private partnership as opposed to the ones we've gotten used to. I, th I, I really think that's central. Um, and the last chapter of my book, I ask then what this means for the kind of rethinking economics. I began with a point by Keynes that uh, practitioners think they're just getting the job done, but they're slaves of defunct economic theory. I think a lot of what I've talked about I have talked too much, so I, I promise I'll stop in a second, is really about rethinking the fundamental pillars underlying how we think about the economy. So how we think about value as collectively created, markets as co-shaped, not just fixed, those dynamic capabilities in all organizations, so the new training that's required within the civil service and that kind of, you know, uh, seeing even themselves as co-creators of value value, not just fixers, but what, is the, what are the creative capabilities required inside, fragility, flexibility, adaptability, and so on. Finance is outcomes oriented, instead of just thinking we can spray money around and hope for the best. Battling inequality in that pre-distributive way, getting the conditions right in the first place. <laughs> um, partnership with actual measures around symbiosis and mutualism that would be really useful. You know, we talk about ESG metrics, but what is the metric that we require between organizations to make sure we're on the right track and it's not an abusive partnership? And this last point that I made about uh, participation, which to be honest, I'm just learning about. I don't think economists know anything about co-design, co-creation, and participation, but it's, it's so important in a system, global system, where there's so much polarization and most people have given up on business and governments and there's huge distrust. I think the issue of participation is huge. And the reason I set up this whole institute, a department at University College London, is I really think it also needs to begin with a new narrative, a new story 
about you know what this is all for and so when the first brochure we made it was very much about crossing out these old ways of thinking like de-risking <laughs> it's not about de-risking it's about welcoming uncertainty and then actually structuring that risk taking between organizations but also socializing not just the risks but also the rewards so that kind of new narrative um, New story, I think, is super important. There's an old Native American saying, apparently Plato said this too, that storytellers rule the world. Well, if we want to you know, claw back and get a, a much better system that is truly inclusive, sustainable, and can meet these goals that we've all signed up to, it also requires a diff very different type of story, narrative of collective value creation. And then the details, and sorry if I've bored you with some of those details, they really need to be ironed out. It's not gonna happen just because we all feel good when we talk about sustainability. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mar Mariana. And you said 60 minutes. I did 60 minutes plus three, so not too much. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're going to move to the Q&A uh, portion. Uh -huh. um, what I would like, if you have a comment or a question for Mariana, uh, Professor Matsukato, mm. please come up here, line up uh, uh, in front of the mic, um, and um, she will facilitate it. I would ask you to be... Facilitate. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not facilitate. <laughs> well, welcome the difficulty well, of your welcome questions. The, the participatory <laughs> part of the, 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 the event. Um, please keep your questions very brief so that we can allow um, everyone to have a chance. Um, so I welcome you to come up. Or I'll call on you. <laughs> All right. Yay. <laughs> Thanks very much. Can you just tell us about Bell Labs? The, the labs? Oh, Bell Labs, thank you. I do have this memory thing, and I used to just say things right away because I knew I'd forget, and I'd do it with jokes, too. I, I was worried I'd forget the ending, so I'd tell it at the beginning, and it didn't work. So, <laughs> so it's good I've started doing it this way. People have to remind me. Um, so Bell Labs, so first of all, you, for those who don't know what it is, it was an incredibly innovative private sector R&D department, which is historically known as having been key to the whole digital, you know, com ICT, information computing, you know, technology revolution. It came out of AT&T. There's a great book about it called The Ideas Factory. I recommend you read it. It's actually a really fun read. But what people don't know, I didn't even know, that it came out of government forcing AT&T <laughs> to uh, reinvest back, so, so this is coming back to my first point about value extraction. It was a, uh, when AT&T had the government monopoly on telecoms, the condition that government at the time set was that to retain that monopoly status, AT&T had to reinvest their profits back into the economy, back into innovation, back into big innovation beyond telecoms. That's why Bell Labs was set up. It wasn't just set up because one day at and is like, oh, we need to do innovation. So it's just so interesting that we don't think about that, like of, of, of government monopoly in that way, government given, government granted monopoly. Patents, I don't like the word intellectual property rights. It makes us think it's like a God-given right. These aren't rights, it's a contract. <laughs> You've been given a 20-year monopoly. So you're getting monopoly profits for 20 years by the government. That's the contract. What do you give back, right? So the government should, in designing these contracts, you know, I've spent a long time talking about how we have to design these systems in a particular way, think about how to make sure, for example, that those patents aren't abused. So patents should be not upstream, so we shouldn't be patenting the tools for research. They're supposed to be downstream. Patents shouldn't be wide, which they are, because patents are increasingly being used just for strategic reasons, you know, like cats and dogs when they pee to keep out the other cats and dogs in, in, in a garden, literally just for strategic reasons, to stake out a territory. That's a wide patent. They should be narrow. Um, and patents should be weak, in other words, easy to license. Those characteristics of a weak, narrow, downstream patent would ensure the government that what it's getting back 
which is knowledge diffusion at the end of those 20 years, happens. Because what used to happen before we even had patents was that there was just secrecy, like in the Middle Ages, right? So the idea behind patents was, and patents, by the way, aren't used in every sector, and there's plenty of innovation in some <laughs> sectors, which, you know, software doesn't really have patents, and there's plenty of innovation. But some, some sectors, like pharmaceuticals, we could debate whether patents are needed or not, but let's just assume they are needed, but the way we structure those patents then really matters because what government gets back instead of secrecy, which means no knowledge sharing, is that by writing it down, right, because that's what you do when you, you know, patent, you actually have to write down exactly what you've done. When the patent's over, you actually have full diffusion and deployment of that knowledge, so you actually get the knowledge spillovers, which is what the public side wants. If you have no idea what you're doing and you've been captured by brochuremanship in the ways that Ernest Brackett warned when you become stupid, you end up misgoverning these patents and it just leads to rent seeking, value extraction and not value creation. Schumpeter wrote a lot about this. Um, so yeah, it's interesting um, coming back to, to Bell Labs that it actually, even though people glorify it, it came out of a a contract, a condition set by government in return for the monopoly status they gave to AT&T. Imagine what it would look like today if we had that kind of ambition and courage, including on share buybacks, which uh, uh, Lenore writes about. Um, you know, that itself could be a condition. Pfizer, everyone knows about Pfizer now because of the vaccine. I've been ranting against Pfizer now for a decade or so. Is there anyone here from Pfizer? No, good. Um, I don't know why, I was asked to give the opening speech for the life sciences strategy, so it was all the pharmaceutical companies. So obviously the government minister who invited me had just seen I wrote something about pharma and my books did well. So I'll like, oh, just invite her. I just put up the share buyback numbers. <laughs> like they were just, oh. and all the little biotech companies came up and you know, hugged me at the end. because yeah. But anyway, Pfizer is a massive share buybacker, actually spends more on share buybacks and dividend payouts than it does in R&D. And it's interesting, it's actually making billions right now on the back of the vaccine, which AstraZeneca, you know, it's not that they are saints or anything, but the deal that AstraZeneca made with the Oxford University uh, publicly funded researchers, yes, Oxford and Cambridge and all UK universities are public, not private, it's a good thing. Um, the, the state in that case actually did a really good uh, deal, I think, with, or a much better deal with AstraZeneca than, than the Pfizer deal was in terms of actually keeping the costs and the prices low and doing much more of the sharing behind kind of a patent pool than uh, Pfizer didn't sign up to any of that. And AstraZeneca said, we're not gonna you know, do this just to make billions, Pfizer's making billions. And it's not surprising, they're literally one of the most financialized companies in the world after Exxon. And we shouldn't call it the Pfizer vaccine or the AstraZeneca vaccine. It was a massive collective collaboration between lots of different entities. Were you Smith? <laughs> for that excellent presentation. Uh, we had a question regarding the SDGs. So mm. in the spirit of leaving no one behind, what strategies do you think less developed countries, for example, in Africa, can employ to ensure that they implement a similar approach to the one that you're presenting about today? Thank you. Um, so, so I'm an um, advisor for Cyril Ramaphosa in South Africa, so I, I work a lot with the civil service there. And they often say to me, oh, Mariana, come on, stop. Oh, this entrepreneurial state. We have a weak state. You know, we can't do what you're talking about. And my answer is often, you need it more than ever. <laughs> because when you have a weak state, the question of how do we actually strengthen the state, not by size, it's not about big state, but smart state that actually can become part of the solution and not part of the problem. I think of, again, South Africa, where large state-owned enterprises like ESCOM, a large energy uh, company that's state-owned, has it actually been part of the problem, right? So instead of just public-private conditionalities that I talked about, also public-public. But that idea that actually to have a, a stronger state, it requires a, um, an active investment within our public administrations and less of the kind of outsourcing that I was speaking today with Leon, see where you, there you are, who wrote a wonderful book called Capital Flight from Africa, very much about also the outsourcing of those capabilities to consulting companies and others who then help manage this capital flight. That's huge. And you know, I'm Italian, so when people talk about corruption and, and nepotism as though I don't know about it, I'm like, 
we invented that, like, thank you, can we get credit for it? You know, the mafia was an outcome. So the mafia, which we've all seen those great, you know, movies about, Sopranos, the series, and so on, actually came out of a weak state. So in Sicily, it was very badly governed. People just, you know, had to basically help each other through mutual self-help organizations. The early mafia was the Società dei Beati Paoli, literally a mutual help organization that then turned into the mafia. So actually getting states to do their job, but with metrics within that hold them accountable, and that's why I'm very interested in issues around public value and public purpose, and conditionalities linked to you know state money going to other parts of the state, like a state-owned enterprise or a public bank, I think are incredibly important in a developing country context, but also in many developing countries that depend, for example, on natural resource sectors, seeing those sectors not as sectors, but inputs towards some sort of cross-sectoral mission, thinking in Chile, I'm talking now to the new government about, you know, copper, <laughs> not seen as a thing in itself, but as part of a renewable or a sustainable growth path. That's, it's, you know, that cross-sectoral focus, not sectoral focus, and conditionalities linked to sectoral transformation are incredibly important also in countries, and in many developing countries have this, where there's a parasitic public-private relationship, where the public just gives out a lot of money to sectors that have captured the government, right? So that issue of a new social contract through conditionalities that are nested within all the different contracts, whether it's public bank loans or procurement uh, strategies, these are all, I think, part of the solution. How to do it, unfortunately, or not unfortunately, realistically, it's really important to start on something, whether it's school meals or something else, learn how to do it in a different way from the status quo, which is that more parasitic inertial system, and then start scaling up the lessons to the system. But first, you need the will to do that. You know, there's many profits being made by both public and private, so money being pocketed by not changing the system. So it's really about holding to account at least those governments that talk about the fact they want to change, that talk about a green deal, that talk about a sustainable, inclusive growth path, and saying, all right, you want to do that? OK, let's get our hands dirty with the details and testing it out, kind of sandboxing it. One of the things we do in my institute is this kind of sandboxing idea, which is if you have a great idea and you try to implement it, working with the civil servants, and then bring back the learning on the ground, because it's much harder than any academic paper, to the theory itself, so practice-based theorizing. Um, but yeah, you, you need to work with willing partners. So, thank you. As a new college student studying econ for the first time, uh, how would you suggest sort of being able to navigate some of the uh, uh, problematic conventional language that we might find in our textbooks? At UMass Amherst? <laughs> you got problematic textbooks? <laughs> um, well, it's a really good question. There's a whole rethinking economics movement amongst students globally. And I think, first of all, definitely tap into that, because I think it, it's, it's, first of all, it's a movement, which is great. Um, I think one of the things I found is also, it's really important also to make sure one doesn't get lazy. So for example, it's really easy to criticize neoclassical text or you know, mainstream textbooks that, oh, there's too much math. But actually, the real problem is they have the wrong math. You know, so just by saying there's too much math kind of makes some economists feel, oh, these little lefties just don't understand math, but actually, there's a great book by an old professor of mine, Phil Morawski, who wrote More Heat Than Light, where he shows actually that the mathematics that was chosen by neoclassical economists in the early days came from Newtonian physics. And it wasn't through a scientific method that they said, oh, that's the problem. I'm going to you know, explore all these different tools to understand that problem. It was more like, that's the solution I want to show. Pareto optimality, equilibria, you know, representative average firms as important. What are the tools? What, what are the equations? What's the body of math that's going to help me prove that? And that was Newtonian physics. So I think also being quite critical of the type of methodologies that have been used, which become kind of self-reinforcing. And I think holding your professors <laughs> accountable if you want to also explain why there's one way of thinking about value or one way of thinking about rigor and having that kind of more portfolio mindset, but also getting part of the movement, I think would be very important. It's a very important student movement globally, um, and it's global, um, yeah. and. Definitely, the UMass professors keep hiring the right ones. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Just kidding. But, UMass, but I should say UMass Amherst is one of the few 
economics departments in the world alongside the New School and a handful of others that have really embraced um, different ways of thinking about the economy. Normally what happens in, in economics departments is there's like history of economic thought. So here's what a bunch of old people said, but now we have the theory, but actually presenting different ways to analyze the economy. You know, different, you know, post-Keynesian, near Ricardian, neoclassical, um, evolutionary thinking, and using different methodologies. That's really important. I think, you know, I mean, that's the best, I think, that a student can have, because then you can choose your own, you can mix and match and kind of find your path. So it's the variety that's really important. It's not just about one dogmatic idea. Hi, uh, my question is about partnerships. And um, while we're here at UMass, I have been thinking about how UMass has a lot of goals of sustainability, but mm. we continue our partnership with Bank of America, one of the top financiers of the fossil fuel industry. So I guess my question off of that is, are partnerships in of themselves more important than individual organizations having their own concrete goals? Really important question. And actually, what's funny is the guy who runs Bank of America, his name is escaping me, is like the guy who's actually signing up to these letters with Larry Fink about you know, purpose and stakeholder value. So calling out the, are we allowed to say bullshit? Yes, yes, good. Calling out the bullshit also of those proclamations about purpose and stakeholder value is just as important. And that's the organizational point, right? So you know, corporate governance driven by stakeholder value surely can't be done also by, um, I think something like 7% of Fox News is actually owned by um, by BlackRock. <laughs> so what does that mean about kind of ESG metrics in terms of democracy and fostering healthy debate? In terms of the partnership, the reason I focus a lot on it is I don't think enough has been done. So ESG metrics are within organizations and universities will have their own type of ESG metrics. The partnership is how you actually work together and I don't think, I don't know of any proper uh, metrics that look at how are we partnering, just like in, in a marriage of any sort, it can also be an abusive <laughs> you know, partnership. So what are the metrics we have to actually make sure that we have that kind of symbiosis and mutualisticness and not a gambling casino like I think we have in the public-private partnerships in the health sector. So it's not that they're more important than the intra-organizational ones, but I think there's almost no work on that. And again, any biologist would hold you, you know, like if you use the word ecosystem, and in my world of innovation, everyone talks about ecosystems, they'd ask you, really? What kind of ecosystem? Predator prey? You know, again, symbio symbiotic, mutualistic? Whereas we just use the word as though it's a normative good thing, whereas there's lots of unhealthy ones. So, so I think they're both needed, and definitely your university should yeah, talk, walk the talk, walk the talk. There you are. <laughs> No, it's, it's hard. So I think what's really important is welcoming the debate, just like any of these things. It's not about saying we're perfect, we're, but it's about what is the right discussion? What are the metrics that can help guide? Uh, do you think share buybacks can have a more positive effect on the real economy if shares were more equitably distributed amongst uh, the common good? And is this oh. a goal like worth reaching for? I think someone else should answer that. <laughs> um, it's, a re it's a very good question, but the, the way that the shareholder model works right now is almost driven by the fact that it's not skewed, like it's that, that it's not distributed. In other words, that would be more like a cooperative model or something of, of our system, right? So shareholder value maximization, trying to improve that just by distributing shares to everyone is it ends up being a different system. And one of the reasons I like, so UBI, for example, is, 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 sorry, this is a bit off topic, but I'll come back to your question. Universal basic income might be a policy I support, but I don't like coming back to the story and the narrative, you know, the Native American saying about storytellers rule the world. The story around UBI continues to be someone else is creating the wealth, and then it gets redistributed in a progressive way, just like we can have progressive or regressive taxation through a check in the mail that's gonna be sent to citizens. Talking about the citizen's share or the citizen's dividend, you might end up getting the same amount in the check as you would with UBI, but the story, the narrative, but also the form it would take in terms of spreading the wealth more equitably, it's just a very different story. You're getting back a share of the wealth you helped to co-create. You're not getting a handout from someone else, right? So I think in that sense, distributing the wealth more equitably instead of doing it by just giving everyone a share through a shareholder value model 
could actually happen through, and it's, I'm glad you asked it because this is one of the things we're working on, is if you think about, for example, having community wealth funds or a sovereign wealth fund that is truly also directed towards making our economies more sustainable and inclusive and getting those citizen dividends paid out through that public fund, um, which is what happens in Alaska, of course. Um, many of these sovereign wealth funds and public banks, as I've already mentioned, are part of the problem, so holding them then accountable, as the question was just made about universities and how they're investing, that's hugely important, but finding a different organizational form that can distribute that wealth in a d collective way, as opposed to tinkering with a shareholder model. Um, I don't know, do you want to add something? No? Okay. It's nice when you start calling in other people. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I'm personally interested in how the food system shaped global nutrition and how governments could potentially reshape it to improve nutrition for all. So in the pursuit of the end, mm. of, uh, in the end of hunger and malnutrition, what are your thoughts about how the United States could ensure that everybody eats well and not just put bandages on a negative market outcome? Hmm. Great question, wow. So, um, I mean, it's, it's a huge question which would require all, all sorts of different kind of policy proposals. Surely having a regulatory structure that's not captured by, you know, the, the food, different bits of the food industry, including the sugar industry, would be an obvious place to start. But I think the government, you know, beyond the obvious points like that, which you don't need me to, to say, I do think that you know, something like that school meal program, it's just really interesting because it means that the role of government also in delivering that food through like school meal program itself would become a funnel for innovation and sustainability. And then you multiply that across all the different levers like school meals, that's just one example that they did in Sweden. It would mean that the way that, like, again, the government is delivering on something as crucial as a school meal becomes also a way to hold itself accountable, right, through that kind of targeted way of, of actually having a definition of what we're even trying to achieve. And I think that's the main point, right, like in this, um, like going back to our WHO Council, right, so health for all, you said food for all, backtrack and what it means for all the different levels, levers, all the different partnerships, all the different tools. There's huge amounts of money. I mean, I, I keep talking about procurement, why? Because it's a huge, chunk of government budgets. Like in the UK, our whole innovation budget is 10 billion. Just the procurement budget of the Ministry of Transport is 40 billion. So think of all the food <laughs> contracts that are go through some sort of procurement system, hospital food, you know, and so on. Learning how to, as I mentioned to the question that was asked before, um, I was gonna say by Smith, but that's just what's on your shirt. <laughs> um, about, how to actually do this stuff differently, learning through maybe something very local and learning what it actually means for changing the status quo of the regulatory structure, of the procurement structure, of that design of public-private partnership and then scaling it up to the entire system, I think is, like that's what we mean by sandboxing. But definitely, I mean, the regulatory capture in the US with food is, you know, is, is well known. Uh, the Rockefeller Foundation has just put out, literally a couple months ago, a very good report on transforming our food systems for inclusive and sustainable growth. Anyway, you could look at that, but I'm not a food expert. <laughs> Hi. Um, first, a comment. Uh, I'm a, a graduate student at the School of Public Policy here, and I really appreciated the, the way that you're challenging how policy and administration degrees are taught. And, uh, so I like that message that you're sending out there. My question uh, with public-private partnerships is the boldness of the government to be able to demand things. Wh when did that disappear? Because hmm. if we look at the state of New York just approved $800 million to help build the Buffalo Bills stadium on, a, like, right. a, on like a $1 billion stadium. So the taxpayers are supporting hmm. most of the funding for that. Yeah. But why? Like, what is, yeah. where is, uh, what happened to the backbone then to say to AT&T, build, b create Bell Labs, like, do these, th like, why yeah. are we kowtowing in these negotiations? It's a very good question. And I think the first thing is to reveal all that completely parasitic, like, I don't think enough people know how bad it is. I don't think enough people know that Tesla would not have existed without a 465 million guaranteed loan from the US government. The same amount, just a bit more, went to Solyndra. 
Um, everyone knows about Solyndra because they went bust, right? Oh, government failure. What about the Tesla success? You know, and the way they structured that had no smart thinking, like you just said. So, you know, Solyndra goes bust, taxpayer bails them out. Tesla does well, must be private sector genius. Even worse, even though Obama had all these Goldman Sachs guys in government, which at least then they could have like taught them, you know, how to do think about investment. They could have said, uh, structure that investment deal properly. Instead, what he said to Elon Musk was, well, not he, the Department of Energy, which was a guaranteed loan. If you don't pay back the loan, we want three million shares in your company. It's like why would you want three million shares in a crappy company that doesn't pay back the loan? Had they said three million shares if you do pay back the loan, which they did in 2013, loan take it out in 2009, price per share in that period goes from nine to 90. That difference, 90 minus nine multiplied by three million would have been more than enough to pay back the Solyndra loss and the next round of investment. So it's both about those kind of conditionalities that you're talking about, but also structuring this stuff so you're not getting screwed, right? Socializing both risks and rewards. And it's not just monetary, it's also conditionalities on the reinvestment, conditionalities on the prices of drugs and so on. So I think, you know, it's, it has been, and I don't like to use the word neoliberal because it just sounds like a big minister on soup of everything, but that kind of neoliberal economics thinking that happened alongside this new public management, public choice theory thinking, that kind of at best market failure theory thinking of what governments are for, you know, that was what Tony Jutt, a famous author who, who died um, in his book, Ill Fair as the Land, he said there was a discursive battle that accompanied this kind of new Reaganite, Thatcherite way of thinking about the state. And the discursive battle, he said, meant that the way government even thought of itself, coming back to having the, the kind of courage to get the right deal, changed massively alongside these big changes like shareholder value maximization is becoming the new big way we run companies. Um, so for example, he, he, he gives really specific examples like instead of talking about departments, administration. You know, small business administration. So we are administering, facilitating. I mean, I added those words, facilitating, de-risking, enabling, all these words I don't like, but, but he said administration. You're there just to administer. You're not a value creator. You're not a co-shaper. So I think, I mean, I would say it started in the 1980s, <laughs> early 1980s. It wasn't perfect before, but it did become a battle against the state. And again, the reason I set up a whole institute around this, but also I think it's a movement between other institutes and departments, is in the same way we had the Montpellerin Society movement, kind of anti-state reducing even the courage within the state to get the right deal for people, and running then these rubbish bureaucracies in that spirit, we need a counter movement. And it's not gonna happen just with better economic thinking. It literally needs to be a movement. You know, we need the media, we need you know, culture. Like it's, it's a cultural movement, actually. And I don't think we've seen it as such. So what reduced state capacity was a movement. And at best, you might have someone like me here giving a lecture, but it's not really a movement. And I do think there's something about asking what would that look like to have a proper counter movement to what we've just gone through in the last 30 years or 40 years. So at some point, this is going to end, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> just kidding. It looks like we have I'm one last question, yeah. uh, and this will be the last question. Yeah, no, I'm happy to take more. After I just threatened. <laughs> Hi, Professor. It's great to have you here. Thank you for being here. Um, I've heard the model, the economic model of China, being referred to as state-led capitalism. Uh, so I was wondering how this state-led capitalism model fits into your framework of public-private partnership, and if there is something that possibly could be learned from there. Interesting. So I once wrote, or not wrote, in an interview some maybe 10 years ago, I said, no, when did Trump start? I can't remember. It was during Trump's um, thing. I told you, my memory is a complete fuzz. Um, so I said that China is learning from the history of the United States at the same time that the US is unlearning it because under Trump it was all about, it was basically a mercantilistic strategy. It was all about exchange and free, and, you know, trade, you know, trade rules having to change and walls and all that kind of stuff. So this kind of lack of, we, we talked about it today in our discussion with the graduate students, there was no proper kind of industrial strategy or innovation policy. It was all about exchange. Um, and I think China has moved away from just being a country, you know, trying to make uh, do with you know, low-cost labor. They are actually, especially around the green transition, one of the biggest innovators in the world. 
so they have a lot of state investment. They were spending pre-COVID, so forget the COVID recovery kind of schemes, two trillion in greening their entire economy through all sorts of distributed policies, including energy-friendly technologies. Denmark, by the way, tiny country, tiny country, look it up. I can't remember the population, but it's very small, um, is the number one provider of high-tech green digital services to China. That itself came out of a very specific mission-oriented policy in Denmark around Copenhagen wanting to be the greenest city in the world, so their startup community became then directed towards actually fostering all these green digital services. But anyway, I think China is an example of a country with a very clear kind of you know, mission around green that has come from this massive pollution problem they have, but <laughs> that is not what I call an entrepreneurial state. So they have a lot of state spending. They also have increasingly these kind of, you know, what they call market-led companies. But w when I talk about the entrepreneurial state, it's about a decentralized network of a distributed capacity of public sector organizations across the whole innovation chain that are working alongside the private sector towards kind of goals. Their current situation is they have huge blocks of state money, like the Chinese Development Bank. Huawei, by the way, would not exist without it. Huawei got a seven billion guaranteed loan. E Elon Musk got five billion from the US government for his three companies, so it's not that big. Seven billion, but still, for one company, seven billion is a lot. Almost all the energy companies, uh, solar, especially in, in China, have gotten these massive loans from the Chinese Development Bank. I think as an innovation system, it's not very distributed right now, and hence the risks are, just like the Soviet Union found, that this kind of inflexible, just big organizations putting in a lot of money might not actually be very resilient, especially not adaptive in that way that I mentioned NASA when it kind of reorganized its um, organizational structure, but that's the question. I mean, they're very adaptive. Someone once wrote a book called The Adaptive State for China. So um, the problem is then democracy too, right? So this issue of, of participation that I talked about, which is one of my biggest interests right now, even though I don't know much about it, so I'm interested because of that. Um, how do you actually get truly co-designed, co-created missions? So cities, are, it's easier to do it at the city level, say, than the nation state level, but what does it mean to be just as ambitious on the social innovations as on the technological innovations in terms of increasing democratic participation? Um, I, I sometimes use this word citizen assemblies and I was told the other day by someone called Christina Lafont who studied citizen assemblies at Northwestern said don't look at citizen assemblies, they're very anti-democratic because they're replacing democratic processes through citizen assemblies, but she said they can be very useful when they're also helping to inform the democratic process. But that point of democratic process and co-creation, co-design is incredibly important to make sure that sustainable growth, innovation-led growth is also inclusive growth. And obviously China's not you know, a model for that. So, but neither is the US, I mean, it's one of the least inclusive countries in the world, especially if we look at issues around health and so on. So I think it is about understanding what's worked in different parts of the world, both on the innovation sustainability side, but this inclusive issue. And that's why it's important to get one's hands dirty with the actual reality on the ground instead of big blanket ideas of partnerships. Yeah, thanks. Thank